And happy Friday, everybody. Um, hopefully you have some good weekend plans and, and hopefully we can get out of the, those of us who live in the Northeast can actually get out of the house without uh, having our toes uh, turn into ice. Um, so first of all, let me kind of open this up to um, to questions um, from the last lecture, questions that we've had previously um, or about any of the previous material. I'm going to apologize in advance for, to everybody. I still have yet to post those three videos, one of which was on IRR and MPV, which I think we covered uh, an example on Tuesday. But I want to just put that in the video just so you'll have it and can look at it later if there's any con confusion on that. Um, I haven't been able to look at everybody's um, uh, uh, assignment yet, but you'll be getting my comments. Um, certainly before I hit the pillow tonight, uh, you'll be getting my comments on your on your assignment. Um, and again, thanks to, for, to everybody for turning it in on time. I do appreciate that. Okay, if there are no questions from, um, from before, then I want to make one announcement, and that's on this right here, Excel Stats version 5. Um, it did occur to me, now there are specific reasons, and we're going to bump into one today, but uh, it has occurred to me that newer is not always better, and um, <laughs> one of the things that's, uh, uh, that's not better about, there are some things I really like about Excel Stats version 6. One of the things, however, that I don't like is that I, I, I that all the slides are not yet in the, in the book, are not yet consistent. And I think I felt that last time, and I, I'm guessing that you did as well. So what I've done is I've posted on the uh, Dropbox, and let me see if I could just go to that. Let me go to the Dropbox, and, um, oops. Can everybody hear me? Uh-oh. Hold on a second. If it's cutting out and cutting back in. Let me quickly go back to this. We were talking about questions, and I wanted to make sure that we all uh, were. Um, I'm going to be using Excel Stats version 5 today because it matches up with our slides. And I've downloaded, so I've uploaded this onto the uh, Dropbox. Um, and it works exactly the same, so I'm just going to very quickly uh, do that for you and show you how to do it. You can go back to the beginning of the lecture then, and uh, if you've forgotten sort of how to do this, I'll give you the link in the Dropbox, so you'll be able to get to this folder that I'm going to right now. This works exactly the same because Excel version 5 and, uh, and 6. You've got 6 installed, but we'll want to install version 5. So move it to your desktop. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull this folder out. That unzips the file. You definitely have to do that. Okay. You can put this in whatever folder you want now. Let's get rid of the zip. <clears throat> um, you can put this now in any, in any folder that you want. Um, uh, right. You can put this in any folder that you want now. Um, and all that we need to do now is just make a copy, I'm sorry, make a shortcut of this file right here, excelstatistics.xlam, which is on the bottom, create a shortcut, and put that on your desktop. And then every time you click this, it's going to do exactly what it did before. Um, that is, um, if you click Enable Macros, it puts this on the bar up there. It works exactly like the uh, Excel 6 did um, in terms of pressing the button. Okay, So um, uh, you don't have to do it right now because um, we're going to be using my computer during this, uh, during this uh, session, but uh, afterwards you probably want to go ahead and do that uh, as well. So it will match the slides better. Um, uh, so, so anyway, um, that's there for you. Okay, let me uh, undo that. I've already done that earlier, so I'm going to undo that. I just want to make sure that it is in Dropbox still. I may have just pulled it out, which would be a bummer. Look at that, I did. 
but I am going to pull it put it back in. There we go. All right, now it's going to be available to you um, uh, very soon. Okay, so um, uh, so you've got that. Okay, the other thing is I want to cover assignment number two. Now assignment number two is ready for you. Um, it will be due two weeks from today, which is the 27th of February. So you've got plenty of time to do it. Um, um, and so let me, um, let me open that up um, now. And I want to spend a little bit of time with it because um, I've tried to make it really, really easy for you to, to not have to search for files and things like that. Uh, but people sometimes do get confused about it. So I'm going to open it up and spend a little bit of time uh, talking through that. So again, it's going to be on the Dropbox. I should just left this up. In the Dropbox, it's, it's in your download. So you could go to that right away. But I will email it out after the lecture today um, so that you'll have it. Right? So if you want to go to the Dropbox, great. It's going to be there. I'll also give a link for the Excel statistics. It's going to be the same link that it was before, so I haven't changed anything. You should be able to find it if you find the old email, but I will send a new email. Um, so let me just go ahead and open this up. Um, this is covering two weeks, so it covers this week and next week, then you'll have one more week to complete it. So um, it covers weeks three and four, due by the 27th. Um, um, uh, just to make sure that uh, I'm, I'm just going to be very I guess angle about this one, please put your, uh, save it often and put your own name on it. Um, so right now it's called uh, assignment number two, name underscore month, month, date, date, 2005. So you know, fill in the month, month, fill in the date, date, and put in your own name. Um, and um, that way it won't get mixed up without any, with anybody else's. Um, all right. So. Um, uh, let's go over what this assignment looks like. Um, um, there's reading and course material just like last time, and there's also some supplementary videos that I'm going to ask you to watch. Um, for weeks three to the end, there's a supplementary video for every single section of the course, uh, which, is, which hopefully is good. So whether we cover it in class or not, you'll be able to go back and see uh, the supplementary video on that. Um, some of these are optional. Um, in fact, most of them are optional. It's up to you whether the reading in the book in the binder was fine or you want to hear some explanation or whatever. It's up to you. Um, and then there are some exercises. Again, I want to make the point some of these exercises are optional. They're there for you to do additionally. It, it's if you want to, and if you feel that there's there's that you're really getting stuff out of it, that's great. Um, there is a bringing out the best in people uh, chapters four, five, six. Hopefully, you've had a chance to read that. I know you have had a chance to read one, two, three, um, four, five, six. You start getting into the actually what all this stuff means and how to apply it, um, as opposed to just convincing you that um, managing people's behavior is. Um, or thinking about management in a less common sense, more scientific way is a good thing. And then finally, there's a very short quiz that I want you to take um, that's very fun uh, on visual displays. Um, and as before, there's a signed discussion. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that one. Um, so uh, here are here's the videos. I'm, Try to make it easy for you. If you just click on this, um, you should be able to get to the videos. There's five that I'm asking you to to watch, um, to cover, and uh, others may be helpful. Let me show you what that looks like on the website. Hopefully, this will come up. There it is. Okay, so this is the this is the website, and you can see the lecture five comes up. And if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see each of the lectures. There's five, four, three, two, one. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit more, here are all the sections in week three. So there's how to analyze data, data analysis examples. Uh, there's what we're going to uh, cover today, inferior control charts, baselining, process capability, 
calculating process sigma, but there's even a couple more probability distribution intro to stat inference. So there's those, and there will be um, posted the week uh, four videos. Um, we'll post them next week, though, <laughs> uh, instead of now. Um, so uh, that's all there. Should be pretty straightforward on how to navigate and get to those and watch those. And um, you know they're not super indexed, so you'll have to click around to find things, but shouldn't present you with too many difficulties. Okay. Does all that make sense? Hopefully it does. Okay. I assume that was a yes. Um, so there's a supplementary lectures. Um, there's reading uh, for your and completing your journals, which makes sense uh, for the slides. Um, and then there's all these uh, exercises. So, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to go over this assignment is because you should look at this and say, okay, there's a lot there. <laughs> now, we're going to cover pretty much all of them or most of them during the coursework. Um, so it's really just kind of going over things again to solidify in there. But I wanted to show you that, that the way that this works is these are embedded files. So you can just you should be able to just click on these. It doesn't always work, but I'm crossing my fingers. Uh, you should be able to just click on these. Okay, there it is. Okay, add whatever you want to do in Excel stats. So let's suppose, and I'm just making this up at this time, folks. Let's suppose you're asked to do a histogram for this particular data. This is invoice. Uh, this is an invoicing question. Um, so that would be going to Excel stats and let's say making a histogram. I know it in one num. I can do that. And there's my histogram. Maybe all I have to do, all I should have to do is select and record it. Or I can do copy paste. And there it is right there. It's in it's in my data file. You see that? It's already there saved in my data file. But when I close this, when I close this, now if I go to my PowerPoint and I open it up again, now I didn't hit the save button, so I may be a liar. No? When I go back to my PowerPoint, you see it's there. So if I ask you to comment on some of the things, you can easily just comment on it. You and you know here are my comments. You don't have to cut and paste and put anything else in PowerPoint. It's already, you know, it's already there. So the next time you open it up, you know, it's saved for you. If you forget, you know, what did this really mean? I want to go back and look at it. You know, there you go. All right. So I'm trying real hard to make it as easy as possible for you to just use the stuff that's in here to answer it. Um, hopefully that makes some sense. Um, a lot of this, I'll be straight with you, the first time you're doing this is I have to figure out how to use Excel stats and to make this work uh, well um, and to make my comments in here. But it, it, you know, whether you use Excel stats or not, just copying and pasting stuff into, uh, into the Excel file. Uh, that's fine. That's fine with me. That's uh, that's a good way to archive uh, this for later. Okay. Um, I've also put in uh, here in red where things are optional. Again, trying to make it as obvious and not as as anything. Um, and then the you can just do the responses right in the body of the text right here. Um, and again, this quiz you can just double click on or click on the uh, on the link, answering your your. I think there's ten questions on the quiz. They're fun. Um, hopefully you enjoy that. Last thing I wanted to talk about was the assigned discussion. Um, it says see attached spreadsheet. Contact your assigned members of the class. All right. So I, I left this in here just so I remembered to talk about it. In previous classes, I had to assign people who to talk with. I'm going to leave it up to you, but here's the point I wanted to make. I don't want you to be talking with the same people every time. So make sure that you uh, that you reach out to the other folks. You have everybody has uh, each other's emails, I believe. Um, so if not, I will I will also make sure that we we have that uh, when I send out the assignment that we'll have each other's emails, and you can 
you know, schedule the time to talk with other people. It's real important that you talk to a number of different people in, um, in the course throughout it. Um, if you feel it would be valuable for me to start assigning folks to, you know, you know, John talks to Steve this week, or Steve talks with Mike this week, or whatever, I'm happy to do that um, if you think that that would be a good way to handle it. But uh, at least for now, I'm leaving that up to you. Hopefully that makes some sense. Okay, questions on the assignment before we move on. On, um, I think it's I think it's on the what's it, what's it the reading. Um, sometimes the question is, did you read that chapter? Um, yep. How how long a response are you expecting? Is is yes good enough? I, to me, it seems short. Yes, <laughs> yes is fine. <laughs> yes is fine. Did you watch the supplemental lectures? Yes. If you didn't watch them, right? No. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All, All right. right. Good. Um, good question. Good question. Other question? All right. So that's assignment number two. As I said, I'll be getting your assignment number one out to you today uh, in terms of my comments on them. Uh, so you'll have that. I already talked about the online videos. Uh, you know where to get them. Uh, but in each of the assignments from now on, you'll have that link so you'll be able to click to them. Um, and I think as you kind of explore, there'll be more and more that's available to you to find, um, which is good. All right. Um, so if there are no other questions, uh, here's what I want to do today. And it's a bit of a call order, especially if it's in this 22 minutes after the hour. But I, I do want to move pretty quickly through this. So uh, I want to I want to finish up the data analysis example. This should be DAE, not DAI, AA. Data analysis example uh, in, in the, that we covered last time. I also want to cover control charts. And I don't think this is going to take us a long time. Um, howe uh, however, again, um, uh, what we're really just trying to do is introduce you to the concept, introduce you to the tools, get you comfortable with using Excel staff to do it. Um, so that'll take a little bit of time. Um, I want to briefly, very briefly, cover baselining and capability. This is like a, uh, I have an hour long lecture on this one. And I got to tell you, this is one thing that in, um, when I learned this, I had a three day course on this, and uh, we're going to try and cover it in like, a half hour, how is that even possible? Well, the way that it's possible is we're not going to give you a lot of the gory details, which I think should be pretty fine. <laughs> uh, what I really want you to come out of this class, uh, and, and I've got process sigma here, and I've, I've put the stars on here because I think that that's a total stretch goal. I'm guessing I'm not going to get to that. But again, there's a video that you can watch to, uh, that is posted already. Um, that you can watch to kind of get the gist of that. If we do have five minutes available at the end, I want to walk you through using the spreadsheet to, uh, that's in the tools and templates, um, and we'll cover it. But the key concept I want to get out of this lecture, um, uh, you know, last time we had this whole, uh, here's the, la I'll, I'll do last week. <laughs> last week, there was one key concept, and this week, this week, the key concept that I want to get out of here is baselining. And I'll just write it up. And just like Hans and Franz, hear me now and believe me later. I, can, I can't do it with the accent, um, for those of you who remember Hans and Franz. Baselining is two parts. OK? The first part, this is what I want you to get out of this. The first part is going to be voice of process, OK? And we're going to get that from a control chart. We've already got something sort of like that, which is a time series plot. Um, but let, me, let me label my axes correctly. This is my output, my y, and this is time, a date, you see. OK, so if I have a stable process, it's going to be in the red line. 
If I have an unstable process, it's going to be constantly out of the red line. So the first thing is I evaluate my voice of the process. The second thing is, and we'll call this, I'll just, I'll just say this is a control chart. We use a control chart to do this. We haven't yet covered a control chart, but we'll find it's just a fancy time series plot. Okay, and then the second part is we evaluate the voice of the customer. Now I'm saying customer, but it could be the business too. Okay, and for this, we're going to have a fancy name for it, and my fancy name is going to be capability. Okay, and capability is nothing other than, despite the fact I had a three-day course on this, it's nothing other than taking a histogram here. You see there's a histogram. Uh, functionally, in your mind, drawing a line where there's a specification or a spec, right? And then shading in one of the two air, one of the two sides. If it's, let's say this is, the, let's say that we're measuring something like turnaround time of a process. In turnaround time, higher is bad, right? So long turnaround times are bad. So one of the things I can do is I can shade this, and I can look at the percent bad. And these two things, in combination with each other, give me the baseline. This is Sometimes I call this stability, just because it matches stability and capability. So those two things go together. Or I might say it's the voice of the process and the voice of the customer. Okay. So I take the is it I, I combine is it a stable process with how good is it performing, or, or how well is it performing? I'm sorry. How good is it, or how well is it performing? Okay, so that's the main thing I want to drag out of this as we as we go forward in control charts and all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, in a nutshell, you just got basically got the <laughs> what the lecture is today. Now, from last week, the key things that we wanted to cover were sort of how you think about analysis, and we're going to go through all the individual tools. But high level. What you're doing is you're taking a process box, right? You're you're saying, here's my process. You're writing down what the output is, the why, right? And you're lab and, and then you're writing all the possible inputs, okay? <clears throat> you're then labeling them as N or C, numerical or categorical. And then one at a time, you're evaluating, I wonder if this particular variable, let's call it x1, I wonder if x1 drives y, right? And this whole PGA process goes on for that. First I, first I plot it. I'm sorry, first I look at the practical. And this is the I wonder if question. Then I make a graph of it. If the graph says something, I back it up with a calculation. If the calculation bears fruit, then I have to do something about it. Um, if it doesn't, then I take it out of my further analysis. Okay? So I guess I'm using the wrong colors here, but if I use blue now to, to X them out or to circle, if I found that X1 was not a driver, I'd say, whoops, gone. I'm not going to analyze that anymore. Maybe I found X2 was a driver. I circle that, then that's something I either further investigate or um, I use in a solution that I formulate when I get to the improved phase. Okay? All right. Hopefully that all makes sense to folks. Um, so without further ado, at this point we're at 11.30, and uh, let's, uh, let's complete um, where we were in the data analysis uh, section. So let's go to slide uh, 43, uh, and we're going to do the example on slide 43. Uh, conveniently, my thing covers up the, the uh, we're going to start on slide 43, which is, you know, we covered cat-cat, we covered num-cat, we haven't covered num-num. Uh, so let's go ahead and cover that. So to do this, we're going to look at an example, uh, mileage versus speed, okay? 
and um, in this case, um, let's just let's just uh, see if we can do this. Um, in this case, we've got um, our output variable. Just look at this. Uh, in this case, we're, we're looking at a, a study, and we want to know the question, does gas mileage for a certain car vary as its speed varies? So in other words, as it can speed be, a, and pardon the pun, can speed be a driver of gas mileage? Gas mileage is our output, which kind of hopefully makes some sense. Uh, this is our output, or our y, and speed is our x. Now, I want to emphasize, we could have other things that we want to look at, like what might be something else that would drive gas mileage? What, be an, what might be another thing that we might measure weight about a certain part? Yeah, weight. Higher There's lots pressure. of other higher pressure. You got it. Uh, how about the driver, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Certain drivers get better gas mileage than, uh, than others. I'm sorry, Steve, you said something? Shape of the car, like aerodynamics. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I just took in my car yesterday, so I'm hoping to. Um, I'm not hoping for better gas miles. I'm just hoping for less noise out of the muscle. So I want to get it today. But uh, anyway, there's lots of things that can be here, right? And this can be a this can be a number, and this can be a number, and this is a cat. But we're just looking at this one at a time. So let's just take a look at the first one. Let's look and see if speed. Uh, is a driver of gas mileage, okay? So let's go ahead and do this in Excel staff. I'm going to go ahead and do it, and then when we do our example, um, uh, which is coming up very soon, I'm going to choose people to do it. We have five examples, five people on the line today, so I think it should work out. <laughs> okay. So, oh, yeah, I've got to come back to here. Come on now. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and do this, and um, here's my mileage versus speed. So I'm just going to open up this. I'll also open up Excel stats. There it is. And I know it's right because it's got the menu option up there. OK. So let's go ahead and analyze this. Uh, Dan asked the question last time, do you have to have the order in Excel, right? And I think the answer was, um, hopefully it got through to everybody, you don't have to have it right here, but you may have to alter it with drop downs once we get to the point uh, in Excel staff. So let's go, go ahead and do that. Here I'm looking at two num. Uh, um, just to repeat, I selected the data, then I clicked on two num. OK, and it should look something like this. We want, in this case, we want a scatter plot. This is called a scatter plot. And it's got a lot of other stuff on there. I'm just going to kind of make this a little bit bigger so we can see it. Um, uh, we want the gas mileage, which is the output. If I convention, we want that to be on the, uh, on, on the y-axis. So you can see gas mileage is right there. And we want speed to be on the x-axis, which it is. Okay, if, if we don't have it that way, the easiest way to deal with that is to simply switch them around like this and so forth. Okay, so if we wanted it the other way, we could look at it the other way. All right, in this case, we're going to stay with the program and it's gas mileage versus speed. And, you know, if you wanted to, just, just to emphasize the point, this is Excel, one of the reasons I like using Excel stat. And so if we want to change the scale on these, it, it's not so hard. We just can format the axis and, and what, what have you, right? We can change with a minimum, and there we go. Um, it's just regular old Excel to do that. OK. So um, we got a scatter plot. And um, so here, here's sort of the methodology that because uh, some scatter plots are easier to interpret than others, uh, here's what I'm going to recommend to you um, to do. Number one, look for outliers. Oops, outliers. So uh, the first thing I always do is I look for outliers. Now, I'm not seeing any major outliers. I might say maybe this data point is a little bit of an outlier or something like that. If I had a data point that was way out there, that's an outlier. 
Well, if I had a data point that's way out there that's separated from the rest of the pack, that's an outlier. Um, I'm not seeing any real outliers on here, so I'm, I'm going to move on past that. The second thing I want to do, oops, the second thing I want to do uh, with this is I want to look at the shape of the relationship. So in other words, do I see, I, maybe just description of the relationship. So for example, how would you describe this relationship between speed and gas mileage? How about this? And fill in the blank. As speed increases, gas mileage blanks. Decreases. Decreases, right. So it looks like as speed increases, uh, gas mileage decreases. So um, basically, we describe it that way. And how would you, well, how would you say that, what, what would you say the shape of that looks like? Would you say it looks like a curve or a line or an eagle or what? <laughs> It's blob. Linear. It looks linear. I'm sorry. It's linear. It's linear. Yeah, it looks kind of like one of the. It looks kind of like a line, right? And in our business, the line is about the simplest relationship that we can get. Like, there's a few different types of relationships. Um, one of them is linear, um, and uh, you know, I'll cover what those uh, in just a second. Uh, what some of those look like, but. Um, like here are some of the different relationships that we might get between x and y. So we might get something that looks like this. In this case, I'd say there's no relationship. OK? There's no relationship. How, uh, how, about, uh, how about this one? How would you describe uh, this one looks like? How would you describe this one? Like the other one, it's a line. Yeah, it looks like a it looks like a line. Um, and uh, if there's anything different about this one, uh, I, I think that's good. Let's take a look at another one that's pretty common. Um, how about this? Um, Okay, how about this one? Curves? It, it still has oh, a... Yeah. Oh, wow. It still has a direction, what? but it's uh, much more scattered. Exactly, exactly. So to me, you can say it's a little more blob-like, but I think the main thing to take out of this one is, yeah, line still works. That's probably the simplest thing, but it's not as tight as this, right? And that's going to be, it's the same direction, um, but it's not, as, it's not as tight as this. That's going to tell, tell us sort of the strength of something that we're going to call correlation. We'll examine this a lot in the week five. We'll spend a lot of time on this in, in week five. But right now, this is just something, it's not really a different pattern. It's just, it looks, it's just a different strength of the pattern, right? It's just not it's just not as strong a relationship between X and Y as it is here. All right? And <laughs> here's just to drive home the point, we could have it in either direction, right? So in this case we have a negative line, a negative relationship between X and Y, and in the other we had a positive relationship. So that's kind of important to note as well. Um, and then um, uh, uh, let's do let's do a couple more. Let's see, what do you see in this one? How would you describe this one? How would you describe this one? More of a wave. That works for me. Um, that works for me. It's some sort of curve, right? And somebody else said curve in the previous one. This is definitely. This is definitely a curve, right? It, it's very, some people I've even talked to before have said, oh, there's no relationship here. No, there's actually a very strong relationship here, right? We want to note this. If we see something like this, it's important to note. Now, this is a kind of a bizarre curve. Uh, somebody said a wave. That's great. Um, that works. Like that, right? 
What's that? Exponential? It's I'm not exponential sure that it's like that. No? I'm not sure that it's exponential. Exponential might look something a little bit different. But uh, uh, um, uh, uh, that we'll, like I said, we'll explore this in uh, we'll explore all the nonlinear or many nonlinear functions that will fit well. Uh, you can do exponentials, but you're going to need multiple exponentials to do this. And we'll find that the easiest way to do this is a polynomial. But but uh, but that's for much later. Um, and and just to also bring home that other the, uh, uh, another point is whenever we're seeing points like this, these are the outliers that we really want to that we really want to take notice of, right? If we see something like this, before we simply fit a line to it, we want to be looking. At, it kind of looks like a sad face. We want to be looking at these points because they're really extremely meaningful. Extremely meaningful. So first thing is, you know, we look for outliers, and we're going to look for the shape and direction of the line, and then we're going to comment for of the the shape and direction, and then we're going to comment on how strong it is. So in this one, no outliers, no relationship, move on dot org. In this one, there's some outliers. We need to check them out. Other than that, there's a line. It's it's positive, and it's pretty strong. Same here. There's an outlier. Relationship between x and y, not that strong. Uh, this one there's an outlier, negative direction, uh, pretty strong. And this one is, oh, there's this funky curve. Maybe it's a wave. Description that I want to use. But whatever I do, I, I got to check out this outlier first. All right. So that's a sort of that's a sort of uh, dialogue that you want to that you want to really um, that you want to really get. So in this one, this is kind of a plain, uh, boring one. We might say, no outlier, line, negative direction, pretty strong. OK? It's really as simple as that. It's important to go through that uh, exercise, though, before you just go ahead and draw lines in there. I've been burned myself, and I've seen others burned by that, by just kind of doing the curve fit pretty quickly. Um, all right. Um, if you've established that it's a pretty strong line and you want to make some project projections from it, then you can start. Then you can click on this correlation and linear regression and actually get, for example, a correlation. This tells me the correlation coefficient. Like I said, we'll go into this in much more detail on week five. I just wanted to initiate us into this. Hey, it's all there for us. We can start doing this, um, and we can. Um, We'll be able to calculate lots of things from this. Here's an equation of the line, so we'll be able to make predictions. If I drive at a certain speed, what my gas mileage would be. Um, I can, uh, down here, I can actually put in predictions, like if I drive 60, uh, this tells me I'd get about 22 miles per gallon on this particular vehicle. There's lots of different things I could do, and we're going to explore how to do this regression uh, and what all the meaning is here. Um, uh, as we as we go on, um, but that's just I'm just I'm just uh, pointing that out to everybody. The important thing is to be able to draw up the plot, which is simple enough by clicking on two nums, and go through that exercise of saying outliers, relationship between the two, what's it look like, how strong is it, what's the direction. Okay, that's the sort of way we want to think about it. Okay. Before we, and I think that is what is covered exactly in here. Here's the trend, and then here is the, the fitting and the discussion about all of that. OK? Um, and the caution. I've given you the caution as well. That this, we have just dipped our toe in the ocean of this one. OK. So what questions do you have before we move on? Um, into looking at a few examples and having you work through those examples. We're good? OK. Um, I'd like us to go to uh, slide uh, 48 now. And, um, and um, let's, uh, let's go through this example. Um, this is, uh, in, in this case, we're talking about maybe a, a company that's baselining. And what we've got is a situation where we've got, hello, let's see if I can get there. Um, maybe somebody who's running a project in an IT department. 
and they measured their key output variable, that's an output, that's their Y, of time to complete account records. Okay? This is a long, how long it takes us to complete a record on our account. It is an invoicing thing, instead of IT. Excuse me. Um, so for each day, January 1st to, to, to August 1st of 2007, they sampled one record per day and checked how long did it take to complete. And that's what we're finding in the, oh, that's lovely. Uh, that's what we're finding in the, um, in, uh, the data file. So this is a turnaround time, so I'm just going to mark that. And it doesn't say anything about any input, so it looks like we're baselining our process. Um, and let's go ahead and take a look. So um, I'm actually going to ask for a, uh, a volunteer to help us walk through um, the analysis and comments that we'd want to do, comments on the overall shape of the data, do we see any outliers, any trends, and so forth. OK. So let's see. Let me close this down, and I will bring up the file. I think that was IT account records. And let's see. Uh, uh, um, let me ask uh, uh, Michael, would you be willing to help us walk through this? OK, great. So. Um, let's analyze this using Excel stats. Um, so let's take a look at uh, what this data looks like and if there's any trends in it, so forth. Great. Um, you'll notice it's, it looks a little bit different than our last uh, one num. It's a little simpler, which is this. <laughs> okay, well, let's start out by describing the shape of that data. Uh, how would you describe that histogram? Um, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we're talking about this picture, right? No, the, the histogram is the one on the top. Sorry. Right. So it's the um, majority of it is happening within this phase. Yep. Yep. It looks like it has a, does it look bell curve? It's, I'm trying to think of the other term. I mean, there's the bell curve, but it has a, it continues to extend out to the right. Yeah. So I think, I think you got it right. Can, can somebody help out uh, with the, uh, the term that we used the other day? Like a skewed? Skewed. It's skewed to the right. Okay? That's the way that we describe this. Or you might say it has a long tail. It has a long tail to the right. But that makes sense, right? Okay, so that's just something to note. Um, and then we can move on .org from that. Um, you know, it turns out that when we do statistics like, for example, the, the average, um, and I'll just point this out in passing. I'm going to take control here for just a second because I guess I'm a control freak. But if we look at the uh, if we look at the uh, the mean of this, the mean is is 26, but the median is only 20. So there's a big difference between those two values. You see that, and that often happens when you're looking at uh, skewed distribution. But the high values. Remember when you were in grade school or high school, and there was a guy who always got 100 percent on the or gal who always got 100 percent on the curve, and you thought they blew the curve. And that's what we're talking about. Those those very high numbers pull that average um, away from being typical. So in fact, in in this example, which one would you describe as more typical, the mean or the median, to describe more a more typical result from this? Think median. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if we if we if we uh, look at this histogram, the median, which is like twenty. Uh, you can see it's in this box right here. So it's much more typical than the mean, which is like near the end of this box. So anyway, OK, great. Um, so now let's move on to this one. And I think this one is, uh, you, were, you were paused on this. Uh, hopefully this is a little bit bigger. How would you describe what we're seeing here in this time series plot? Yeah. 
It looks like a layered oh, curve. It looks like a, a layered curve? Yeah, it looks like there's two sets of data going in kind of a curve, you know, the wave. Like a bottom wave and then a top wave. Ah, I think I hear what you're saying. It looks like there's something that's going on. I'm paraphrasing this a little bit. It looks like there's something going on here. And maybe something going on here. Yeah. Exactly. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. That's interesting. Um, let's. Uh, do you remember from last time what we talked about? Now this is this is a time series, right? This is a time. This is time. Mm -hmm. In this case, because we, uh, it said they collected each data point, and if we go if we go into our data and remind ourselves what the data looked like. Here it is right here. This was January 1st and then January 2nd and so forth. So we're looking at the data over time uh, right here. Um, so when we're looking at a plot like this, the first thing that we look at in almost any plot, see if we can remember that. What's the first thing that you should be looking for in any plot? Outliers. Outliers. You got it, right? So before we start looking at shapes or anything like that, we're always looking for outliers. So um, I like what was discussed, but let's step back for a second and you know, do we see outliers here? We, we could say a lot. But not, yeah. Not, not yeah. So that, but there's a lot of straight, yeah. yeah. So there's there's none that are like way out there, right? There's nothing like this. And it kind of, I think it kind of matches what uh, what Mike had said, and what I think it was Mike and Tammy, what Mike and Tammy had said about the histogram. Essentially, I think what we're seeing is um, uh, is um, you know these right here, which might be outlet. We're seeing these right here, right? That's, that's my guess is that's exactly what is matching up, um, and so the the real question is are they becoming you know more prevalent over time or are they not? So once we finish the outliers, um, let, let me just go back to this again the time series plot. The next thing we want to see is do are we seeing any? Let me erase that in this too. Uh, are we seeing any patterns over time? And the, the one pattern that we really want to see is there's some sort of overall trend. And even though there might be, I think, uh, I think that was Tammy who said that, or maybe it was Regina. Um, but yeah, it looks like there's maybe two things going on here. And that's interesting. To me, that, that is pretty interesting. But it doesn't seem like overall it's going up. It doesn't seem like it's trending up or trending down. It's kind of undulating a little bit, right? It looks like there are some periods, if I take off my, my scribblings here, which I take off my scribblings here, I think we can kind of see that maybe um, there are some periods where there's a lot of variation, and there are periods where there's not so much variation. Like, for example, this, maybe at the end, right? So that might be interesting to take away. But again, there's no overall. It doesn't look like this is getting worse over time, getting better over time. It does look like there are some periods that are going on in those different areas. OK, very good. Um, so again, you know, this is one of those things where, um, where until we have control charts, when we get to control charts, and hopefully in just a minute or two, uh, we'll be able to make more comments about it. OK, well, thank you, Mike, uh, for, for doing that. Uh, let's see, before we move on, what questions do you have about this one? A lot of information you can just get by just looking at one variable, right? These plots are very rich. They give you a lot of information. Okie doke. I'm not going to save that down. I won't open up this one. Let's take a look at the next one. And this one is given on slide 50, uh, amplifiers. So, in this case, we've got a company that makes amplifiers. And what they want to do is num reduce the number of replacements that they make. So they, 
maybe they make these amplifiers and there are things broken in them, and so they have to replace these, so it costs them a lot of money, so they're defects. Um, they collected some data recording replacement incidents by noting the type of different the type of replacement made, and these are in column N in the data file. So let me open up this data file, and then I'll ask somebody to help me walk through it. All right, so here's my data file, and I'm going to get Excel staff to open as well. Okay. And uh, Steve, will you help us walk through this one? Sure. Okay, great. So in this case, I've got an output. And my output is uh, replace, uh, the replacement. So I want to look at the replacements, which are given in column N. And it's right. an output. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've had to give you a control. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> there you go. All yours, buddy. <laughs> so, um, I bet they're just looking at the replacement part only. I thought maybe there was um, an input to this. Well, there are many inputs, but right now we're just looking at the we're just looking at baselining okay. this process and understanding so, what replacements are being made. Okay, so it's just uh, one category. Uh, Correct. And here, okay. I go to Excel, uh, to Excel statistic, uh, do a one cat analysis, mm -hmm. Okay. There I have it. There's a lot of stuff going on here. There you have it. <laughs> I'm going to make this just a little bit bigger so we can read it a little bit better and then make comments on it. I'm also going to, excuse me, I'm also going to open up these. Um, no, I didn't want to open that so much, but just so that we can read some of this stuff. There we go. Laser. There we go. Okay. So hopefully we can read this. So these are all the errors. And uh, so if you were on this project, Steve, and you were baselining, you said, okay, we're making all these replacements, uh, what, does, what would this do for you? What would this data do for you? Where would you well, start to, you look know, for things that sticks out, you know, like a sore thumb. Um, so yes. <laughs> because this chart is the laser, it's way out there. So that got to grab your attention that, yeah, most of your problems are with replacement of lasers. Right. And then you there can you go on down. The other ones are not as significant, but laser is the most significant one. Right. Any, um, now, I, I'm assuming that not everybody or maybe not anybody knows you know, sort of the background of this one. Uh, these, these are optical amplifiers. You know, what a DCM is, or what housing error works, or broken fiber means, or anything like that. But um, what might be another question that you might ask? Yes, laser certainly seems like it sticks out. But what might be another relevant? What might be another one or two relevant questions that you would ask before you just said, "Hey, let's let's focus on lasers." God, pardon the pun. I it really didn't need to. Um, I would that say one. cost. You might worry about the cost. What cost is involved? I would say that. Say that again with more. I, I said you might, you, might worry, you might worry if uh, what, what the cost of the, the the cost of those replacements are. Exactly. Okay. So we might want to fold in cost to this, right? To say, okay, we're replacing a lot of lasers, but. Um, do they cost a lot of money relative to broken fibers or the housing or DCM laser? There's only one of those, whatever that means, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, great. So that's definitely something we want to look into. What is some, what's another thing that kind of pops out in this one? Um, would it be like the, the de definition? Is there like some subcategories? I mean, is there a hundred different things that could go wrong with, with the laser that would maybe break it down into further categories. Maybe it's showing there's 1,300, but maybe DCM is really the issue. Yes. Well, I, I, I guess the question is, um, yeah, so it's helpful to know those breakdowns. I'm hesitant to say maybe DCM is really the issue because they've categorized it this way. But there are many different uh, reasons why the lasers were replaced. You're probably going to get the most bang for your buck going into the lasers. 
Um, but I think you're right. We don't. Know, we're, we're not trying to solve problems here. We're just trying to say what's the most fruitful area for me to, to uh, drill down into. Uh, it certainly seems like ways. Is there anything else that somebody notices or would take away from this particular piece? There's two DCMs. There's two DCMs. Excellent. So why might that be? Data integrity issue. Might be a data integrity issue. So that's definitely something you've got to check out, right? Because if I add both of those together, that's close to, I guess it's 456. That's quite a bit. So now it might even be competing with this. So I might want to figure out what's going on there. Um, anything else? This is a really minor one, but uh, notice there's also one that's DCM laser. What is that? That's a combination of those two? Is it one or the other? Is there a subcategory? I don't know. I think back to, uh, I think it was Regina who asked the question, I guess, or who made the point about the laser and drilling down into. That's something that I'm going to pack away and ask the question about, although there's only one of those, so maybe I'm not all that concerned about it. OK, that's, that's about it. Um, that's about it. Um, th again, there's, there's not too much to this, but those are some sorts of things that you want to be looking for, data integrity issues, where can I drill down on a one cap analysis? What questions do you have about this one? All right, good deal. I'm going to close this one down. Let's go to the um, let's go to uh, the uh, let's go to this one, which is tax abatement. Okay, and uh, here we have people in a county with both urban and rural areas were asked whether they would consider a tax abatement in exchange for the county's right to erect cell phone towers. Okay, so let's draw up what this looks like. Um, here, we've got uh, an output is the answer to a survey. They sent out a survey, right? And they got an answer and they tracked where the survey went. They tracked lots of different things, demographic things, but one of the things that they tracked was whether it was in the city or whether it was uh, rural. Okay, so here we've got the answer to the survey, and here we've got um, here we've got uh, residence type. I'll just call it RT, whether it's country or city. Okay, and uh, so this one, uh, residence type. What type of variable is that? A C or an N? Is that cat or no? Cat. That that's a cat. Okay. Important to get this down. How about answer? Is that a num or a cat? Cat. cat. That's a cat. And now we'll, we'll verify that when we look, look at the data file. But notice that the answer here is do you agree, do you disagree, or are you neutral about that? So those are categories. Um, they could have asked it differently. They could have said, do you agree with this based on a 1 to 5 scale, in which case we'd have a num cat analysis. Okay, But it looks like what we've got here there's a cat-cat or two-cat analysis. So let's go ahead and, and do that one. And uh, let's see. Uh, Regina, I'm going to ask you for help on this one, OK? OK. All right. So this one was uh, tax abatement, I think. There it is right there. Excuse me, Mark? Yes. This is Tammy. I've got to step out for about 10 minutes. I've got an issue quick, and I'll be back as soon as I can. All right. Fair enough. Good luck. OK. I've got this open again. OK, so let's see. Oops, I did it. Regina, all you. That would be two cat, right? You got it. You got it. All right. Now, this one looks a little bit different from last time. And uh, what we're going to find is, is later in the lecture, uh, when we go through this, we're going to find that what's on the summaries tab of, of Excel, 5, Excel Stats 5 is often very helpful to us. So why don't you go ahead and click on that summaries tab, uh, if you will. See on the bottom where it says summary? Go ahead and click on that. Okay, 
Now, remember, last time we also said that it's sometimes hard to remember. I'm going to move this back up again so you can see it. It's sometimes hard to remember or to see, like, a one way um, a plot may be helpful to us, and the other way it might be more helpful. So um, just what's your interpretation? Are these all, um, do you think that, uh, that uh, residence type, remember that if, whether they're in the city or the country, that that might be a driver of whether you agree or disagree or you're neutral? Yes, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah, no question about it. No question about it. What I, wa what I want to see is if you can click on swap variables, go ahead and click on swap variables there, and, and tell me, if, uh, Regina, if you think that that is more easily seen now. Do you think now that it's more easy to see that resonant type might be a driver of whether you agree, disagree, or neutral? Yes, that, that top uh, graph. Yeah, yeah, this is the graph that we want to be looking at, this highlighted one. I'm going to emphasize that one by zooming in a little bit. We definitely want to be looking at this top one. And uh, in this case, it's very easy to see, right, the blue and the red bars are comparing rural to city. And uh, this one's pretty clear to see. Um, remember last time I think I told you guys to go ahead and click on two standard errors? Well, this one actually has the confidence interval built in, and we're going to cover that. Um, do me a favor and click on confidence interval this time instead of plus two standard errors, OK? You're going to know what that means um, not by this lecture. It looks almost exactly the same, which is why I told you to click on two standard errors. But here, what we're going to be eventually doing is looking for the overlap between the, uh, the comparisons that we're looking for. So everybody knows that all data have some uncertainty to them. Like if you're doing a poll, there's a margin of error, right? Well, what this shows is what's the margin of error for each of these groups. So for example, we can definitely tell that if you're looking at whether people disagree or not, um, if you look at the bottom of this right here, see the bottom of this one right here? It does not overlap with the top of this. So we definitely can say there's a clear difference between these two. Likewise, with the agree, definitely. But if we're just ch checking to see are people, is, we want to see if there's more neutral people in the city or the country. We don't really have enough data to say that. Now, in this problem, who cares? It's definitely a driver, and we want to go forward with that. And we'll probably want to use that in our solution. If we were trying to, if we were with the company that was trying to push the tax abatement, maybe we would, um, maybe we would go to the city flow folks, right? Because we know that there's a lot of them that are disagreeing. Okay. Hopefully that makes some sense. Hopefully that makes some sense. And I want to show you what happens when they, they do, excuse me, when they do overlap. Uh, thank you, Regina. Uh, when they do overlap, remember this one that we did the other day. Um, oops, and I'm going to have errors if I don't close this down, which is kind of a bummer. OK, so now I've got to open it again. And hopefully it will work. Um, to cat. When we did this uh, on Tuesday, we had this situation where we're looking at the CGI from the, the guys at the gas company, and they wanted to know about the can't get in. And here we said, we're pretty comfortable that there's no real difference here. That's exactly what this is saying when we add in those error bars. See, there's overlap here, and there's overlap here. So what we're going to say later is there's no statistical difference between these two groups. We're not just eyeballing it anymore. We're actually doing the calculation right here, so we can definitively say there's no difference between these two. So I'm not looking at manager as a solution to this problem. Pretty cool. I, I love that we can put a plot and the calculations both in the same in the same thing. Okay, great job with that. Um, let us, as the rabbit said, let's cover the. I hope I didn't shut down my. I didn't. Uh, let's look on service level versus capacity, which is on slide 54. Um, so uh, in this case, we've got a, uh, a situation where a, pro a company provides a service uh, for its customers, and customers rate the service. So it's the service rating is our key output. That's what we care about. 
And I don't know what that is, whether it's a number of cats. We'll check it up and we'll see. And it looks like we're looking at capacity as our input. Now, there could be other inputs, again, to this, but we want to see is capacity a driver of service rating. OK? I'm going to ask you to help me out on this one. We'll just kind of remember this drawing here for just a second. You're breaking up, Mark. Oh, you okay to have on that, John? With doing that one? Sure. Okay. Whoops. The answer way. <laughs> Your service and capacity. Okay, we'll go to it. Okay. And, and, and if you could kind of talk, oh, I've got to open up that telephone for you. Sorry about that. Sure. There we go. Okay. Uh, it looks like uh, number, number. Perfect. Love it. Okay. I'll let you keep going here for a while. I don't think we highlighted the data. Oh. Yeah, we didn't highlight the data, so do over. This is a do over. And do me a favor, just uh, we're gonna I'm gonna cancel this out. Yeah, just go ahead and cancel this out. All right. Good. Uh huh. There we go. And now let's make sure that we get the let's let's make sure that we have our x and our y correct. So what's the output? And what's the driver? And what's supposed to be on the vertical axis? And what's supposed to be on the horizontal axis? Those are the que that's the question. The uh, service level is uh, should be on the other axis. Got it. Should be the Y. So let's yep. So let's go ahead and change those by using the drop down. Excel Excel stats is smart, but it's not as smart. <laughs> All right. Good. Okay. There we go. All right, perfect. Now I'm gonna blow this up for you a little bit and I'd just like you to go through just the interpretation of the scatter plot. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna go from uh, I'm just going to make this a little bit easier to read. And 40. Okay. Oh, should have been able to do better than that. How about the 60? Oh, goodness gracious. That, that's better. That's better. And let me blow this up a little bit. So, John, how would you interpret the scatter plot? Okay. Uh, there could be some outliers, you know, maybe here, uh, here. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, there does appear to be a relationship between uh, adding more people and an increasing level of service. Okay, great. And you would say, as you add people to this process, what happens to the service level? It increases. It increases. And would you say it's a strong relationship or a relatively weak relationship? I would say it's a strong relationship. OK. Great. So I think all that's a fantastic. Uh, I think that's a great job you did with that one uh, in terms of saying, first of all, identifying the outliers, which I, I, you know, I love that you picked up on this one, maybe these right there. A lot of people will pick out this one, but really that sort of fits the pattern, doesn't it? So it's not so much an outlier. Um, so, but on the other hand, uh, it's not as strong. As, it's fairly strong, uh, but it's not as strong as uh, maybe the gas mileage one that we did before. So all that's good. And I think at this point, that's all we really want to say. Uh, later on, uh, in oops, in uh, in subsequent weeks, we'll want to go to here and look at this value and say, ah, we've quantified sort of how strong it is. And then if we want to make predictions, we can make predictions from it. But much more on that later. OK? Great job on that one.
Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's uh, cover uh, let's cover uh, the last example, which is discharge time. And I think we did this one. So I'm going to move pretty quickly. I think everybody's had a chance, except for Tammy, and I think she's still out. So uh, this is uh, discharge time for patients that have two similar types of, uh, uh, of in, inpatients. Like let's say they came in with chest pain, were measured at two hospitals, and the corresponding summaries are in discharge uh, time. So this is the time that it takes you to discharge somebody from a hospital, either at hospital A or hospital B. Okay. Um, I think there's actually it's hospital number one and number three. This is going to be a numb discharge time is a numb, and our input uh, is hospital, and it's going to be a cat. So we've got one numb, one cat, which is uh, which is a pretty common one. Uh, so let's go ahead and see if we can open that up. So it's discharge time, bingo, bingo, boingo. Got it. Oops. And I've forgotten to open up Excel stats. Uh, you probably won't have the same problem of having to close down every time. Um, I noticed that when I went to 64-bit Excel, I have to do this, uh, which is another reason I wanted to go to version 6, but this wasn't working. So we'll select one on one cat. I get this error. You will not. Another reason why I didn't want to do it. We could look at the differences between means here, but instead we'll want to go to the summaries. And uh, there's going to be a couple of things that we'll look at. We could look at separate frequency charts like we did last time. Uh, should come up. Not coming up. OK, I'll go back and see what happens. There are box plots that we looked at this time. There we go. Oh, there's my, there's my frequency charts finally coming up. There's my box plot. It looks like there's maybe a little bit longer discharge times in hospital number three uh, than in hospital number one. I could look at those histograms. I think you guys did that last time, made some comments. Yeah, this is what was supposed to come up and did finally. Here we are. So it looks like discharge times for hospital number three are a little bit longer than for the others. And we can even do a mean plot where we can look at those confidence intervals and understand that there's a significant difference. More on that uh, as we go on. But essentially, all these things are showing to you, yeah, it looks like hospital three is a little bit slower than hospital number one um, in how long they take to do the discharge time. So that is that. OK. Well, uh, this was a big, this took us a long time to go through, but we covered a lot of ground. And like I said, we're going to be covering this you know, more as we go through with the analysis stuff, um, uh, which is really starting uh, big time uh, uh, next week uh, as well, um, particularly on Friday. So uh, before we go on, um, I would like us to take a minute or two to, as we've come to the end of the uh, of the lecture, to say, we look, we covered the one variable analysis, which is one none, one cat. Um, and this, uh, we know what that's for. And we've covered two variable analysis. We haven't covered n variable analysis where we have multiple inputs. But that's all coming. Let's walk before we run. And now you at least know how to get those plots up. And um, we've, I think we've done some good practice reading those, uh, reading those plots. So um, take a moment or two to do this. And then we will move on to the next section, which is on control charts. Um, and um, I think we'll cover control charts and capability pretty quickly. And uh, we'll have the backup uh, of those. But uh, let's, uh, we, can, we can move into this. Control charts and capability will only add one or two little wrinkles. Take a minute to fill in this, and then we'll move on. Hello? Hi. Oh, you're still there. Okay, I'm back. It's Tammy. Hi, Tammy. 
Glad right to have you back. Right here on the, the review section. Okay, got it. No sweat. Yeah, we're just about to move into the uh, into the control chart. Okay, um, I'm going to leave the rest of that to you. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about control charts. So uh, remember that this is an introduction. And I also said early on that there was this two-pronged, mm, a two-pronged attack to baselining that we're going to uh, that we're going to do. Um, most of us in the past have said, you know, if somebody says, "Hey, let's baseline a benchmark a process," we'll say something like, "Well, on average, the turnaround time is blank," or "On average, the defect rate is blank." And while that's okay, it's certainly a lot better than nothing. <laughs> That's for sure. We're going to find out that this is a much more robust and complete uh, way of analyzing a, a, or a state, excuse me, of stating a baseline. It's much more useful. And the two things that we're going to do: think about the SIPOC, the back end of the SIPOC. Over here, we have our customers, right? So, wh what we really want to do is connect our key outputs, which I'll call Y, with our process and our customer, right? and the customer. So that's what, when we're measuring something without, we want, we're saying we want a baseline with this, we want to capture two parts, the voice of the process, or the VOP, and the voice of the customer, or the VOC. Okay? Control charts are things that, they look very similar to time series plots. And remember, we're looking for outliers first, and then we're looking for trends and patterns and all this kind of stuff. That's all. And the control chart is exactly that. It looks at my Y over time, but it has these two red lines over it. And we'll talk very briefly about where those lines come from. But the bottom line is they come from the data. Um, they come from the data themselves. And they tell us the voice of the process. Okay? So understanding whether something is stable or not whether something is stable over time, or whether it's changing over time, or whether it's erratic, is a key, one key part of the voice of the process. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at the histogram of the data. And you know, today, we're literally going to look at a histogram. And we're going to effectively draw a line. And I'm going to draw a different color of the line for a reason. There we are. Whatever that is, say if you're measuring turnaround time and high turnarounds are bad, I might want to know the percent bad. And this is going to be the voice of the customer. So whether a process is stable or not tells us something about the process itself, but it doesn't tell us, it tells us about the stability of the process, but it doesn't tell us about how good the process is with respect to the customer. So it's telling us only whether something is good with respect to the customer doesn't tell us enough either. It doesn't give us any insight into the nature of whether it's a systematic problem or whether it's a run or whether we can just do a one-off on this. How easy it is to fix. Okay? So control chart are these right here. This is what we're going to talk about. This is a control chart right here. Alright? I'm just trying to save a little bit of time of going through slides. Okay, so after we complete this, you'll be able to assess the stability using a control chart. And we'll talk about a few patterns to look for, but mostly I just want us to, to do this. Now, there's a couple different places where you can use a control chart. Uh, a baselining process, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And monitoring a process, which is what we'll be talking about in the future. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, I think it's unfortunately, when Walter Schuhart, who invented control charts, he invented them for these right here. This, this should be a clue into why they're called control charts instead of something else. Because I got news for you. Control charts don't control anything. <laughs> However, they do help you monitor a process and tell you whether a pro if you listen to control charts, they will tell you whether it's a systematic problem or uh, whether it's a uh, one-off that you can deal with and should deal with before going on to fix other things. Okay? So that's what a control chart will do for us. We already talked about this. I already talked about uh, Walter Schuhart, Bell Labs, so there we are. 
I just want us to keep in mind we are baselining our output. So if your output is defect rates on invoices, great, that's what we're baselining. If we're baselining turnaround times on appointments, great. If we're if we're baselining um, the cost of, uh, of of waste in a in the development of an op or in the production of an optical table, that's what we're talking about. That is our output, and we're only baselining the output. All the left side here. The X's we're not interested in for baseline. Okay, so what is a control chart? As I said before, it's looking at that Y, that key output variable, over time. Okay, so these are dates, and these red lines are roughly at uh, plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean of the data. So, and that's the key thing is that we get them from the data. So we have to collect data over time. And then we're going to plot the data based on something that's very, very similar to plot to plus or minus the standard deviation. So I always get the question, why plus or minus three standard deviation? And the real answer is because Walter Schuhart said so. <laughs> but here's, here's a more scientific explanation to that. If we look at a normal distribution, remember that's a bell-shaped distribution. It turns out that if we if we do some calculations on that bell-shaped distribution, it turns out that 68% of the data falls in between plus or minus one standard deviation, whether those are types of adult males uh, or whether those are uh, 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 batting average of a typical uh, uh, major league baseball player or something like that. Uh, if it's if it's a bell-shaped distribution. 68% of the time, you get people or data points that fall in between um, the mean and one standard deviation from that mean. Okay, 95% of the time, you get every, you get data within two sigma, and nine, almost almost all the time, but not quite. Three times out of a thousand, 99.7% of the time, you get data within plus or minus three standard deviations. So Walter Schuhart realized or reasoned that if we get data points out here, that it's worth our time to look into them. We're not going to be chasing our tail. We're not going to be wasting our time because that only happens three out of a thousand times we get data points out there, so, or, or conversely out here. So when, some, when we get a data point that's out there, it's worth our time to check it. If we're running an ordinary operation, we don't have an awful lot of time to be checking data points that are pretty common. So we don't want to do that. Okay? So that was Walter Schuhart's reasoning. And uh, back in the 90s, or I'm sorry, the early 2000s, there was a British academy. I can't remember what their name is right now. But they basically did a lot of the studies on, uh, on this. And they determined that it should actually be 3.1 standard deviation in my brain, who cares? It's three standard deviations. This is really kind of arbitrary anyway. Let's just set it at a level that what, that's what the rest of the world uses. And, um, and let's realize that what we're doing is we're trying to keep ourselves from chasing our tail. We're trying to make it so that when we have an outlier, it's a real outlier. Hopefully that makes some sense to you. To point, put a point on this, if we found a point that was here, the idea is we don't need to investigate that, or if it's here. But if it's here, we're going to assume, you know what, this came from outside the normal standard operation of the process, and this is a point of instability. So we need to investigate that right now. So here's an interesting question that comes up a lot. OK, well, what if? This is not good. What if this is, I want to know what happened here on this day that distinguishes it from this day. They're different. How, how, how would I, you know, what if this is something that was actually not good if we're looking at turn on time and I want to get better? Shouldn't I hold myself to maybe two standard deviations? Would that be a better strategy? What do you guys think? Walter says three. Three. 
<laughs> okay, so I, I like that answer. <laughs> but here, here's the here's the answer. Well, you, you'd be well, allowing a lot of bad stuff to go to. So I mean, stuff that's outside of uh, um, maybe not not conforming to go to. Ah, okay. So that's a good that's a good point. Is to say is to ask the question: Where are the customer specifications on this plot? is to ask a further question to everybody. Where are the customer specifications on this plot? I mean, what are they? Not shown here. They're not shown. That's right. Remember, a control chart is the voice of what? Is it voice of process or voice of customer? Of process. Voice of the process. The only thing a control chart can do is to tell me whether something is stable or not. And here's the reason why you don't look into these points individually. It's because these are systemic problems. If you have a problem with this point, you probably have a problem with a number of other points that are in here, and that's going to take deep analysis of all the data. I'm going to have to look at all the data if I want to understand what's going on. Now, it, a, a data point like this, close enough for jazz, maybe, it's, maybe I'm going to look into it. But a data point that's out of here, I'm going to I'm going to waste some time. I'm going to spend I'm going to spend some time right now up front and say let me figure out if I can um, do something about that right now. So that's essentially that's essentially the reasoning. We have other tools that we're going to use to uh, let me just get rid of all that. We have other tools that we're going to use, but the control chart is going to help us. Um, Dealing, at pro dealing with problems in a systematic way versus dealing with problems as a one-off. I mean, what would happen if you dug into this? If you dug into this point and you figured out, oh, okay, I know what went wrong here. Process is fixed. Probably not, because you've got lots of other times that it's also not as good. Did you really nail them all? Whereas if you have something that's way out there, the idea is this is a true outlier, and it's probably something that came from outside the system. Now, we're going to be wrong once in a while, no question. But that's the reason behind a control chart. Hopefully, that makes some sense to you guys. OK. Um, now, just to also give you a, uh, uh, give you a heads up, um, when people talk about control charts, there are many, many, many control charts. We are going to focus on just doing one control chart. It's called the individual's control chart. It, it's almost always, not, I'm going to say 98% of the time, it is the right control chart to use. We will cover the other control charts and we'll cover more, them more deeply. But right now, I want us to just get used to using what's called an individual's control chart. And uh, in Excel fast, that means just we'll pick that. Um, and you'll see how that works. But it also is almost always the correct one to use. The only changes, uh, like in the car companies, the car com the auto companies, they do X, they do X bar R chart. You see this right here, an X bar R. Why? Because they collect lots of data in what are called subgroups. We're not going to be likely to do that. Um, so um, we're going to use all individuals charts. Okay. So uh, let's. Uh, and the rule that we're going to use is uh, exactly what I just showed you. If it's inside the lines, we're going to invest. Or if it's outside the lines, we investigate for special cause. If it's inside the lines, we say it's exhibiting. We're not going to say everything's okay, but we're going to say it's stable. Remember, we still have another piece of evaluation coming. That's the voice of the customer to say whether it's bad or good. Okay. Want to emphasize? Control chart isn't the only thing you look at. Okay, that's why that's why we're doing this. But the first thing is to uh, is to uh, is to uh, put that out there. Okay, um, let's do a, let's do an example. Um, so let's do this one right here together. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you how to do it, and then I'll have you guys do the other examples, and we'll make the comments on it. Uh, doing control charts and uh, and interpreting them is not hard. The hard thing is just doing it. It's collecting data. Okay, so in this case, we've got uh, a group that that um, um, uh, they collected some time-ordered data, sales. This is sales data. So 
So maybe they were interested in understanding what they're baselining their sales process, right? So that's what we're talking about. We're looking at one data point. I'm sorry, not one data point, but here we've got demand, which is like the amount of sales that they're making, right? This is in dollars, or I think it's thousands of dollars. Okay? And uh, this is going to be a number, and we're going to baseline our data. Right? We're going to actually, we're just going to do the voice of the, the voice of process. See whether it's remained stable over time or not. Okay. So let's uh, go ahead and do that. This is product demand. Now, um, um, uh, let's do it the old-fashioned way that we used to, and that was we're going to go into Excel statistics. This is one num analysis, right? Let's go ahead and click on one num. We're able to get a lot of stuff out of here. Uh, let's forget about the histogram here for just a second. We'll come back to this in a moment. In a moment, we'll come back to this when we do capability before we close today. Let's try to see what time we got. Yeah, we have a little bit of time. We'll, we'll close on this. Um, I got a 15. There we go. So it looks, again, it looks loosely like a bell curve right there. But let's take a look at this, and let's look, take a look at the time series. Remember, we're going to look at outliers first and patterns as well. Is this process going up? So let's first of all look at outliers. Do we see any outliers here? Between uh, 30 and 35? Looks like this might be an outlier, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe some people might say these. Here, here's, the, here's the thing that you know the control chart is actually pretty darn good at, is it helps us understand what's worth our time to look into. Now we can always choose if we want to, to spend a little bit of extra time looking into that. It's going to also help us understand whether there's any other patterns that we see, but right now, and, and trends, but right now, let's, uh, let's, we're just going to be really looking for outliers to say whether this is a special cause or whether it's a, it's what it's called common cause. So let's use a control chart to do this. That's what the control chart's good for. Whoops. All right. Let me close that down for a minute. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. Now, to do this, um, I hate to say, to say this, but it does take a little bit of love in Excel stats. It works a little bit differently than OneNote. So you'll notice, first of all, that there's a few other workbooks here. We're going to be, excuse me, for control charts, yes, we're going to use the control thing. So uh, I'll go through this. Um, and I'll walk you through it, but it, it, it takes a little bit of love to get this right. So the first thing that we do, unlike before where we select it and then just clicked on the thing that we wanted, that doesn't work for control chart. So we have to open up control chart first. All right, and we're confronted with this. We want to click numerical. Now that one's easy enough because we know we have numbers data, sales, right? We have sales data. And here we're looking at, yep, it sure looks like it sure looks like a number. Okay, so we click on this, and now notice that we've got a bunch of these things right here. These are different control charts. There's an X, there's an X bar R, there's our S, ah, there's I for individuals. We're going to go there in just a moment, but first we have to deal with the data. So let's click on the data. All right. Now I have to clear out the data that's there already. Uh, I can do that in a number of different ways, but right now I'm just going to clear it out. There, now it's gone. Okay, and it looks like it did it right because it got rid of to the time one. That, that's that's going to be something that we'll check into as, as we go forward. But okay, now I just have to paste that in. I have to be careful how I paste it, but I'm going to paste it in. Um, I'll copy it. I'll go right up there. I copied the header, so I want to paste it right there. I'll paste numbers wait a little bit, and Excel stats will fill out the left-hand side. It looks like it did it. Okay, if all that happens like it just did, you're good to go and just go ahead and click on I, and the control chart will be done for you. You should recognize this. 
um, because it's exactly the same plot that we had before, but now it's got the it's, now it's got the control limits on it. So the short answer for what we had before, um, for what we had before is this is not uh, this is not something that we should be look that we need to look into as an assignable cause right now. It's not a big outlier, so we're probably best saying that this is a stable process, and we're going to move on and look at the capability before we finish the baseline. So our baseline on this one would be process is stable. Done. Now, that was a lot of work to just simply say that, but notice that this potentially saves us some time chasing our tails, looking into data points that are, are really pretty common, that may be systematic issues. Um, and they probably are. And if we want to get rid of them, we'll need to look into a little more deeply. Okay? Hopefully that wasn't too bad. It made some sense. What questions do you have on that example before we before I close it up and we move on to uh, another couple of example of examples? Okay, let's do another one, and uh, uh, let's do another one. Let us uh, do the example that is on, uh, not this one, no, 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 here we are. That was the one that's on uh, page 70. Let's do the one that's on page 72. So on this one, we have a company that uh, turns on services for its customers. Could be you're turning on an account. Could be you're uh, uh, putting in a, 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 a assigning an appointment to a doc. Uh, could be uh, something like that. Okay, you're, you've got a new client and you're making the billing active. Whatever. Uh, I imagine that this was a bank and uh, this bank uh, every week they um, they check a hundred accounts. And they look at the proportion of those accounts that they turned on on time. Okay, and we want to see whether this is remained stable or not. So here we're looking at proportion good. So let's take a look at that. On time services. Um, so that's in this one. And uh, so here, again, we're looking at an output that is. Um, Essentially, this is like percent, since we're looking at 100, this is the percentage of times that we, that we do it on time. Let's make a control chart. So I could click and then pick it, but I realize that that's actually wrong. So let's go to control, numerical. I'm going to clear the data out. Now, there's a couple of different ways to do this. This is probably the simplest way to do it. Okay, looks like it did it right. Um, if I keep my head, if I just put paste the data, I paste the data in here, and it will just give me the header obs1. Uh, if I want to put the actual header, um, I copy the header, num on time. Okay, and I'm going to paste that in. Okay. And now all I have to do, if everything went well, all I have to do is click on I, and then I should get my control chart. There it is. There's my control chart. All right, so I know this isn't going to be rocket surgery for anybody here, but what do you think about this one? Is this a stable process or not? What would you do if you were confronted with this data? It's all fairly stable, but investigate the one crazy point to the right. <laughs> Right. Okay. So uh, but if this isn't popping out at you, I don't think anything will. This is an outlier, okay? <laughs> this is something that you need to look into. Were our systems down that day? Did we have a key absence? Who was the manager on that day? All of, question, all of those questions are totally relevant now. You have uh, my absolute blessing, and you, should, you would even have Walter Schuhart, the absolute blessing, to go in and check this one for a special cause and understand it, okay? Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. All right, now, here's the question. Other than this, is the process good? 
What do you think? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask again. Does a stable process mean good process? It's a good process if the the deviation is small. Uh, so this mm. particular plot, it seems like if you take that out lion point, it's uh, pretty close to the mean. Okay. Well, so it's pretty close to the mean. So does that mean that it's a good process, though, is really the question. Remember, right. capability is two parts, the voice of the process and the voice of the customer. Right? A, a stable control chart just tells us that. It just says it's a stable process. But a stable process could be good or it could be bad. For that, we have to look into the voice of the customer, and that's the other thing that we're going to do. However, hopefully that makes some sense to everybody. Just because something's stable doesn't mean it's good. It's only part of the it's only part of the picture. We'll continue on down this line, uh, but uh, I want to challenge the, uh, Tammy's assertion also that says other than this, we it's a stable process. How do we know? How could we tell whether it's a, other than this is a stable process? Let's suppose we checked into this and found out, oh yeah, that was the day that Tammy was gone and everything went crazy. You know, we, we, we know that she was indispensable and we can't function without her. And uh, so we're going to make sure Tammy's never absent again without her planning. Okay, whatever that is. Let's suppose we did that and we said, okay, we're going to remove this data point from our analysis. Right. Let's see if, that's, if the data are stable without that data point. That, hopefully that makes some sense to folks. Excel stats actually can do that for you, and so what I'm going to do without having to remove it from the data set itself. So kind of remember about how wide these lines are. Okay, mm -hmm. what happens when this goes out? Our three sigma should be tighter, right? Mm -hmm. So when we do that, I'm putting a, a small. See how it has this big X and the small X. In Excel stats, <clears throat> uh, that means if you type in one of those. I'm going to type in small x. Something happens. So uh, let's just see if something happens there. And it turns out that this looks the same, but oh, this is grayed out. Oh, and look what happened to these red lines. The red lines are tighter now, right? And in fact, it's close, but without that data point, the process is indeed stable, Tammy, as you said it was. But there are a couple of ones that were pretty close that we might want to think about investigating in. Um, but that's how we can tell whether if we remove some data, whether the process is otherwise stable or not, we can remove the data from the calculation and see if it, if it actually is. Hopefully that line of reasoning made sense to folks. However, you know, to, Steve's, to the comment that Steve made before also, if we remove that data point, it's still only 77% of the time we're doing something on, uh, in this case, um, living up, up to customer expectations. It's actually pretty not the greatest uh, process. I wanted to show you what happens if you put in a capital X. You put in a capital X, it actually removes it from the plot itself. I kind of like that as much. I like the little X because it shows it in the plot but removes it from the calculation. So um, anyway, just a little a little thing that's in itself there. Okay. Um, one other thing that I want to show you in Excel stats, and, and whether or not you've seen this before uh, or not, if you double click on things that are red, when you double click on things that are red, it'll come up and give you a dialog box so that you can read it. And that little thing about the X's that I said, that is, it is in here. So it's kind of nice that it, it gives you some online, uh, it gives you some online help about, you know, how do I proceed? How do I use what's here? And that's true everywhere. It's true. Well, I guess it's not true. Not true of the headers there, but uh, it does say uh, you know on anything that's data, you can click on that and it'll tell you. Um, it'll tell you. So if you click on that, it tells you a little bit of an, about an X bar control chart. Here it's going to tell you a little bit of, about uh, an individual's control chart. I'm not sure where it put it, but in any event, gives you some help. All right. Um, so that's, uh, I wanted to make sure that we covered that 
before we uh, before we finished up um, uh, today, and um, uh, I know it's ten minutes too. If people could stick around for another five minutes, I want to give the rest of the picture um, just so that we get the whole uh, what's going on with voice of the process, so we can put it all together. Um, um, this is in. I do have a video that's up about this. Um, by the way, that's all of control charts. So hopefully we've covered uh, everything that uh, you feel comfortable that you can try this. Um, it does take a little while to go and say, am I doing the Excel stats in the right order and stuff like that. You can also call me up and talk to me uh, during office hours. But the key takeaway of this is a control chart is the voice of the process. Um, I want to cover uh, uh, in the baselining section that comes next. Um, uh, that comes next. Um, it's about putting together the beginning and the end. So the voice of the process together with the voice of the customer. How do I do? Uh, how do I do both? And I'm going to show you in Excel stats how you can do the right hand side. How you can come to the voice of the process together with the voice of the customer um, and, and do both of them at once. Now I'm going to do the example in the back so that we have it, but realize I want you to realize there's lots of there's lots of there's a little bit of reading, um, and there's four when you look at two things, there are four things that you could there are four uh, situations that you can have, right? You can be good at both, you can be bad at either one, or you could be bad at both. And so these pictures kind of cover all of those situations when you're looking at both the control chart and the capability of a process. So we're going to do that for um, uh, for the example that's given on slide 85, which is uh, wait times for a DMV. We're going to do the complete baseline. Okay. So in this case, uh, we've got a DMV, and they're interested in speeding. They've noticed that at peak times, they do a terrible job of moving people through their their process, and they want and people are complaining about how long it takes. So for 90 days, what they did was they measured, uh, they took one measurement, uh, say during the peak times between 11 and 1 uh, of one person, and they collected data in time order. So they have you know, January 1st and January 2nd and January 3rd, and I'm making these dates up, but I just want to make sure the data are in time order. Let's uh, go through uh, this, and it says from customer interviews and discussion with project sponsors, Specification is that we don't want customers to wait more than 18 minutes in line. So 18 minutes is kind of what they got from the, the customer that, that said 18 minutes and above is bad. Let's make sure that we're not bad. So let's see if we can go ahead and calculate that, okay? Or it, go ahead and do a full baseline. So uh, I'm just going to go to the uh, the tail of the tape here, which is right here. Uh, DMV wait time. Okay, and we'll baseline this process. First stop on the train should be the control chart. So let's take a look at the control chart. I've got my Excel stats open now, so I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, control, opening it up. Numerical. Clear out that data. And I did clear the headers. Don't have to. It gave me one back. Okay. And let me just copy and paste this into there. I'm going to paste it as numbers. Wait a little bit, see if it got it. Looks like everything's okay. Let's see if this process is stable. Okay, there's my process. What do you think? Stable process, unstable process? Stable. Looks like it's a fairly stable. There might be a couple of things that I look into. Maybe I look into uh, this point right here that I'm highlighting or that I'm pointing to uh, with with my spotlight. Maybe this point. Maybe this point I'm interested in. Those are near outliers, but there's nothing that's clearly out there. So um, it looks like a fairly stable process. There's a few things I might look into. And I wouldn't fault anybody for looking into a couple of these. That's totally fine. 
if you want to do that. But it does look like it's a fairly stable process. Okay, so uh, that means if we have to fix this process, if it's not good, then uh, then um, well, then we're probably going to have to look into it systematically. There's not going to be any quick fixes, right? We're not going to be able to figure out, oh, yeah, this was a problem on this day, but other than that, everything's good. So now let's look at the capability to see if this is a problem worth fixing. If it's a problem worth fixing, there's going to be a lot of, the percent bad is going to be high. Okay, that's the idea here. That we get from capability. So in that, I'm going to show you how to do capability. Um, and just then I'll remind you that there's a couple of sections. We will cover this next Tuesday. I'll spend some time in the beginning talking about capability so that we get it again. But um, um, I want to give you enough so that if you want to start the, home, the uh, assignment, you can. So capability, here's how we're going. Here's the simplest way that we're going to do it. One of the ways to do capability is to simply count how much is good, how much is bad. All right, so let's do that. We can do that using one num summaries tab. We're going to look at a histogram that we can add stuff to a little bit. So on the summaries tab, notice where I am on the summaries tab. I have a lot more tools available to me. Okay, first I'm going to make this a histogram. This doesn't really matter all that much, and then I'm going to show the values. Okay, and uh, I'm going to put the percentages. And all I really need to do is count the percentage that's above, if I want to count percent bad, count the percentage above 18. Now, I can add all these up, and I can already see this is a very, this is a bad process, because remember what we said, that customers don't want to wait more than 18 minutes in line. It looks like there's about, I'm, I'm, I'm going to estimate there's about 60% of the people are, are not, we're not meeting the spec, right? So the voice of the customer is going to be terrible. However, I want to show you a, a, a one way that we can do this. One way that I'm going to try and do it is I'm going to try and get it so that my I have 18 here, um, or e at least even numbers. So I might want to change my from and to. What if I made it from 10 to 32? All right, that didn't help. Um, hmm. Uh, how about 10 and 36? That's not helping. How about 0 and 36? Maybe that'll help. There we go. Now I just played around with that. Now notice I'm coming up with a multiple of 18. So eventually I'll come up with something where I can have an 18 there and make that over. If I choose something that's divisible by 18 or by my spec, I can do that. Now I, I could add up 37 plus 28 plus uh, 3 plus 4. Uh, that wouldn't take me too long. 37 plus 28, that's what, uh, 66, 65 uh, plus 7. Boy, that's terrible, right? 72, um, that's pretty terrible uh, in terms of percent bad. Um, so that's one way I could do that. A simpler way of doing it is just making two boxes, which I can do by putting two classes. And there it is right there. That's actually pretty pretty simple. Uh, and and I'm just just to emphasize, I'm going to color this orange. That's the bad stuff. That's pretty bad. Um, that's pretty bad. Um, so anyway, so hopefully that uh, that that's that's kind of the way that uh, that we could look at it. We could look at um, uh, you know here's our here's our process. That's the percent bad is 72. And if we wanted to, we could cut and paste our, uh, our control chart there and show that it's a stable process. So it's a stable process, 72% bad. This is, if anything ever screened for a project, that's a project, right? Because we're consistent, but we're consistently bad. We need to improve all of our performance. It's systematic. We're not going to fix the problem by just looking at a couple of one-off data points. So. Um, so that's it. So our baseline is stable process, 72% bad, end of story. Now we're ready to go in um, and, uh, and uh, go into the analyze phase. So hopefully that made some sense to you guys. Um, I realized I went fast on the capability, so feel free to call me this afternoon or set up an appointment and we can go over it in Excel staff to do that. 
But I wanted to give you enough so that you can, if you want to go forward with the, with the uh, assignment, you can. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stay on the line to, uh, to uh, answer any questions that you have right away. But I want to, uh, I'm going to stop the recording at this point and, uh, and uh, wish you a great weekend. Hopefully it will be warm at least tomorrow. I know it's going to be cold again on Sunday. Um, but uh, I wish you a good weekend, and we'll see you again on Tuesday. Okay? So thanks, everybody, for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mark.